Good morning. And welcome to worship at Calvin Presbyterian Church. My name is not Debbie Carroll. I, I am Peter Cameron. Debbie is, uh, she couldn't make it, she is sick. Uh, I'm, I am uh, a pinch hitter, and uh, I'm one of the elders here at Calvin. And uh, Kathy Cooper, our, our uh, interim uh, sabbatical pastor, uh, is uh, on vacation. She'll be back uh, this week, so uh, uh, she's back after a two-week vacation. Um, and she's been subbing for uh, Pastor Kevin while he's on sabbatical. So uh, we want to all, as a result, we want to welcome Karina Hoyt, Reverend Karina Hoyt. Uh, she is an old friend to Calvin. Um, she is also the state area director for Young Life. And she will be, um, uh, she's taken a new call. So in the next month, she is going to be going to Riverside Covenant Church in Riverside, Rhode Island, where she will be their pastor. So we are really glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Let us pray. God of the covenant and in our baptism, you assure us of our belonging to your kingdom and call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Even as we worship you this morning, fill us with this place, with your spirit, that we may be assured of this and that we may faithfully witness to and receive again the good news of Jesus. Amen. Now please join me in the call to worship, which is from Psalm 145. Please respond with the bold print in the bulletin or as found on the screen. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. Now please stand in body or in spirit as we sing hymn number 150, Come Christians Join to Sing, which is in the uh, Presbyterian Blue uh, Hymnal. these words of Jesus. 
Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What an invitation that is. In a world weary and heavy laden with sin, as a people wearied and burdened with sin and the effects of sin, our Lord invites us to come and to be unburdened. So let us do just that. Please join me in our corporate prayer of confession, which is printed in your bulletin. This will be followed by a moment for personal or silent confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and but what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now please, moment for personal confession. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Jesus continues, For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so we are reminded of who Jesus is and who he is for us, gentle and humble, in the place of our rest. Beloved of God, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. seated. In Christ we have received peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And now let us take a moment to uh, share the peace of Christ with each other. I think the passing of the peace is our favorite part of the worship service. <laughs> our scripture reading this morning is from, uh, actually there are two, it is from Matthew in uh, chapter 20, verses 17 through 28 in Psalm 130. If you'd like to follow along, this can be found in the Pew Bible on page 22 in the New Testament and uh, 573 and 74 uh, of the Old Testament. As we prepare for God's word, let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit 
that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. And now from the book of Matthew, the good news. While Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves and said to them on the way, look, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked a favor of him. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now from the Old Testament, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Your ear, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord, there is, for the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It's fun to see some of you here today uh, with your kids who are adult kids. It made me think about uh, getting to church Sunday morning when my kids were little and how in the morning it would be like, what can go wrong will go wrong. Like you'd finally get them in clothes they agreed to wear and they'd spill the entire bowl of cereal on themselves and you could only find the left right one was nowhere to be found and you finally get them in the car only to realize your keys are in the house somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be beyond those days. My boys are not with me this morning. They are teenagers, not because they slept in. I got them out of the house at 7.30 this morning to go serve at their home church where they're serving in music and um, on the audio. Uh, but. My questions I ask are different now. Um, it's not where's your left shoe as much as did you sleep in those pants? Um, it's just life changes. <laughs> Sorry. Our kids grow. And I was thinking about this because in our passage today, it's a mom. It's a mom of a couple of boys like me, grown men, young men. And she comes to Jesus and says to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right and one at the left in your kingdom. And when I first read it, I'm like, oh, she's that mom. <laughs> you know, the one who's like manipulating the system to get the best for her kids. The one who um, just will do anything it takes. You maybe met her at a bus stop or a PTA if you've had kids. 
But the truth is, the more I have interacted with families, the more I've listened to those moms, I've grown, my heart has softened towards her. You know, maybe she's a mom that just saw all her kids had sacrificed. Following Jesus around, their home, their income, the family business, their future security, her future security. She doesn't quite understand the kingdom of God yet, and she just wants to make sure they're not going to be taken advantage of. The truth is we don't know her motivation. But Jesus, he turns to the sons and he says to them, can you drink this cup? imagery of cup. Interesting choice of words because the cup would have been seen as one's fate. Also, it was in the Old Testament, the cup was a symbol of God's judgment. And so he says, can you drink this cup? A lot of commentators have said that it's a hint at Passover. And we do see that right after this, he goes into Jerusalem and has Passover with his disciples. And there are four cups that are drunk during Passover. Um, the first cup is the cup of sanctification. The second cup is the cup of judgment. And then the third cup is the cup of redemption, which is also called the cup of blessing. And that is the cup that historians think Jesus instituted communion over. That Jesus gave us communion to remember his work of redemption and our subsequent blessing over the cup of redemption. And it's interesting to me that it can be called redemption or blessing because with redemption, Christ bought our redemption with betrayal, suffering, death. It's, it's tough stuff. And yet when I think of blessing, I think of ease, right? Comfort. But re our redemption is bought, our blessing is bought by Jesus at this steep price. So redemption and blessing. And then the last cup is the cup of acceptance, which was also called the cup of praise. And that's the cup we think of when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me. Because Jesus would have been at Passover with his disciples, where they would have ended Passover by drinking this cup of acceptance while scripture was sung and read predicting his death. I can't imagine what that moment was like to have this cup in your hand, listening to words, predicting your own suffering and death. And it says, then immediately, he got up and went to the garden and prayed, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup of suffering, let this cup of your judgment pass from me, but not my will, but yours. Jesus didn't want to suffer any more than you or I do. Let this pass from me. And yet, he says, not my will, but yours. I think it is often easy to get buy into this popular concept that the goal in life, the goal in faith, is to get through the hard times, get over the pain, get past, you know, just get to the blessing. Get over it, get past it. But the model we see in Jesus is someone who leads into and of the suffering. He left that garden and actively moved towards what he knew would be unbearable suffering. And as I thought about this, I thought about when those things come in our lives, when those tough things, when those pain, when those suffering, it feels like hitting a wall. You ever feel that? You're just like, Bleh. sometimes I, you know, it feels like we bounce up, end up back on our butts. <laughs> But Jesus doesn't bounce off. We bounce off. We kind of try to numb it out with some food or some Netflix or, if you're me, a really good book. Or we avoid it altogether. Or we just try to get over it, right? Just get over it. I was talking to a young woman a while back, and she was 
back, and she was grieving the loss of a potential relationship. And she said, I just kept telling myself, you shouldn't feel this way. You didn't even have it yet. Well, as the story goes, that didn't do much to change her emotions. And it caused a lot of confusion in her current relationships. Because we can't selectively numb. We can't avoid without numbing our other relationships and our relationship with God. And Jesus' model is so different as he leans into the pain. Father Greg Boyle puts it this way. I really love this. He says, if we don't welcome our own wounds, overconfidence and fear of being taken advantage of causes us to despise the wounded. That's everyone else, right? But when our wounds are close at hand, it leads us to compassionate understanding. That's the beginning of something transformational. Jesus leans into the suffering, even onto death. And in verse 22, when he says, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink this cup I'm about to drink? We are reminded that to identify with Jesus' glory is also to identify with his suffering. But that's not where it ends, which is great news, right? When I am at the end of my rope, when I am exhausted, when I can't see a way out of the situation, where everything control, I need to be be reminded this is not the end of the story. I was remembering those classic books, The Lord of the Rings, and Frodo in them is on this quest to rid the world of this particular evil, and it is just overwhelming, and his friend goes with him, and they reach a point where it seems impossible. They are at the end of the road. There is nothing left. They have no water. They have no food. They're going to starve. This is it. And his friend says this to him. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. You ever feel that way? It's like the great stories, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want it to end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. He goes on and says, folks in these stories had lots of chances to turn back, only they didn't. When we face our own darkness, when we walk through the suffering, we find our God-given inner light. When we learn to lament together, that's part of the beauty of the story. Samwise never leaves Frodo. It's done together. It leads to hope, because lament always leads to hope. And when I read this passage, it becomes clear that James and John had a limited understanding of the cup God asked, Jesus was asking them to drink. But they also had a very limited understanding of the blessing. They think, their mom thinks, it's, there's room for two to be blessed in God's kingdom. One on the right and one on the left. That God's kingdom works like human kingdoms. And it's so much better than that. Jesus pulls all the disciples aside because James and John and their mom might have asked the question, but how frustrated the rest of them are with it shows they don't get it either. So he pulls them all aside and he tells them, this is not how we work. This is not how followers of God work. It isn't about hierarchy. It isn't about power. He says, to be great, you must be a servant. Honor and glory, servanthood, position found in humility, prestige replaced by obedience. Not the social equity and the manipulative power that our world 
world leans into. There is room for all. Father Greg Boyle, again, I've been listening to his books in the car. He says, if love is the answer, community is the context, and tenderness the methodology. Transformational power found in tenderness. And Jesus points to himself. Just like I, the God of the universe with all the power, gave it up to give my life as a ransom for you all. Don't miss that word, ransom. A ransom is an amount paid to free a captive. And the amount of the ransom is directly related to the value of the captive. If you're up in a position of leadership, if you capture the king's daughter, man, you get to raise that ransom. If you're looking for your worth, it's found in the cross. Because Jesus gave everything as a ransom for you. I read in Deuteronomy where it says to Israel, God did not choose you because you're most numerous. You're not. He chose you because he loved you. And God didn't choose us because we're most numerous. We can, like John's mom, we can start to think that blessing looks like worldly blessing. We can think it's about the amount of people at our events, or if there's more people at the Easter egg hunt this year than last year, or if we get a lot of affirmation, or if we have really great pictures for our website, or if our family shows up to church on time and sits neatly in a row. We can start to think those things are blessing, but Jesus, he redefines that all. And he says it's not because of any of those things. It's because he loved you. Truth is, the last few years have been hard ones. And I'm guessing we have all hit a wall or two. Maybe we had a moment where we thought, gosh, when things go back to normal, it'll be better, only to find that we don't recognize the new normal, that the hard relationships are still there, that the losses keep coming. Friends, after suffering the deaths of so many things, as we lean into and live into and together, there is room for God's blessing in the ways we haven't even imagined yet. Because we you, because it's in you, because you, of all the peoples of the earth, are his treasured possession. As we follow in Jesus' model of leaning into and hard out of the confusing, the hard, the uncertain. There is blessing as a community and as families. Amen. Will you stand as we respond to the word with the singing of hymn number 356?
Please be seated. Now please join me as we affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed, which is printed on your, in your bulletin or is on the screen. Now let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The psalmist declares, the Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. In response to the faithfulness and goodness of God, let us consider the gifts of time, talent, or resources we've received and how we can respond in gracious faithfulness. If giving to the ministry of this church is a way for you to do this, you may give your offering as the offering plates are passed in the pews. If you use the online giving option, use the blue online giving cards and put them in the, uh, the, the uh, plate to uh, designate that you've been giving online. Now let us give with glad and generous hearts. Today's offertory hymn is Waymaker. It's a praise anthem, and the words to the chorus are in the bulletin, so please join me. Who you are, you are here. 
God of unending gifts, we praise you for your abundant goodness. As you are generous, we want to be generous too. May the gifts we bring extend your generosity into the world so that all people may be made whole and find the rest you offer in your goodness and grace. Amen. Announcements. Uh, let's go over a couple that are in the uh, the blue form in your in your um, bulletin. Building and Grounds has an important meeting on Tuesday at seven. Uh, we are talking about the uh, bids we've received for the residing project. So uh, that we're we're the Building and Grounds committee is doing their work. So hopefully we'll have some uh, decisions in the near future. Uh, just our Vacation Bible School is almost here, July 17th, next week. Uh, so it'll be uh, 9 to noon. So if you have uh, kids in your neighborhood or in your family that uh, uh, it's, it's what, how, what's the age? Um, <laughs> crickets. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 you, it's, Elementary school, it's definitely, it's younger kids that are, uh, it's the age group, so uh, <laughs> call, call the office. <laughs> uh, there's also opportunities to serve uh, the uh, food pantry down the street uh, this week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, you can see the times in the bulletin, uh, so uh, that's really, uh, uh, it's, it's amazing at the amount of need, how that's increased in the last couple of years to the point where um, we were causing traffic jams and they had to change the time that they were doing it. It's, 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 it's important work. So uh, this week, if you want to gather uh, and do that, talk once again to the office, let them know, and they'll give you details on that. And finally, the uh, Woonsocket Community Meal, um, they'll be making uh, sandwiches uh, for the meal that we're providing on July 22nd here at church. So. If you plan on being there for that, let, uh, let the office know. Any other announcements that should be um, mentioned at this point? Okay. So why don't we go into the, uh, the uh, prayers of the people. Um, Does anyone have any prayers or joys? <laughs> DA. Okay, your brother Bill is having a, a heart procedure. Other joys, concerns? Okay, let's, uh, let us pray then. Let's pray for the church, for our loved ones, friends and enemies alike, neighbors, strangers, for the communities and for the world. So uh, it's, as when I say, Lord, in your mercy, would you please respond with the words, hear our prayer. Let us pray in the spirit who helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the spirit, we pray for the church. Help us to share the gift you have entrusted to us 
the good news of your free gift of life in Christ, like a cold cup of water to a thirsty soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the spirit, we pray for the earth, liberate the earth from the domination of death and restore it with the blessing of abundant life so that generations to come may sing your praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the spirit, we pray for all nations amid the daily news of war, famine, and disease. Announce, announce the good news of your peace. Come quickly, establish your holy realm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the spirit, we pray for this community. Enable us to extend Christ's welcome to all so that they may come to know and love you and receive your gift of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the spirit, we pray for loved ones. Remember those who are too often forgotten, the abused and neglected, the vulnerable and weak, our tender loving care members, Miriam, Dot, Fran, Bob, Ken, John, Matt, Elaine, Linda, Adrina, and Charles. Let them rejoice in your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now in this moment, hear our prayers for those who rest and weigh on our hearts. We're happy and joyful that Sue and Trudy are here today. We pray for David's father, Chung Rock. We pray for DA's brother, Bill, in his upcoming heart procedure. And we pray for those that rest on our hearts, people fighting with illnesses and those who are just fighting with life. We pray, Lord, that uh, they receive your peace, that they receive your healing touch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the spirit, we pray to you, O God, confident of all things, work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Above all, we give thanks, O God, that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who taught us together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, in the power, in the glory forever. Amen. And uh, will you please stand in body and spirit, war and spirit, and sing our closing hymn, Shall We Gather at the River, which is printed on the yellow insert in your bulletin or can be found on the screen.
Psychologists have coined a phrase, post-traumatic growth, uh, but it's a biblical concept. The God who saves our tears in a bottle will not waste our pain as we learn to participate in his upside-down kingdom where kinship and servanthood are the marks of power and of leadership. Hear these words from Psalm 130. Hope in the Lord, for with him there is steadfast love and plentiful redemption. He will rescue you from despair, for his steadfast love endures forever. As we go today in assurance of his mercy, may his love guide your steps and may his blessings be always upon you. Amen. Thank you.